Math 31, welcome to section 5.6, Rational Functions. And this is a huge section. There's so much information in here. It's very detailed and intricate. And this is the section where we're really going to learn how to graph rational functions. Our learning outcomes are all about rational functions. We want to find the domains of rational functions. We want to figure out where vertical asymptotes occur. We want to figure out where horizontal and slant asymptotes occur, or one or the other, you can't have both. And then we want to graph these rational functions. And the trickiest part to graphing rational functions is there's so much variability to it. Rational functions don't look like any one type of graph, and, and it's harder to pick up on patterns for rational functions than it is for polynomials. So let me just remind you of where we've come from and where we're headed. So we've talked about polynomial functions. And we've talked about different traits for them, like domains, x and y intercepts. We talked about end behavior. We didn't get into vertical asymptotes or holes. That'll be something that we get into in this section, or in, yes, in this section and in this chapter. But, um, and we graphed these, okay? Now we're gonna have much funkier looking graphs. And like I said, there's a lot of variability in here. So I wanna talk about the different traits just in general right now, and then we're gonna pick them apart as we move through the examples in this section. And our end game for this section is for me to give you an equation of a rational function and for you to graph it for me. So if we take a look, I'm gonna be giving you rational functions in this section, which means I'm gonna give you a ratio of polynomials. So there's gonna be a numerator and a denominator. And for all of these problems, the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is figure out what the domain is. And that will be the first example we look at, but we have fractions, so our denominator cannot be zero. So there's going to be numbers that we throw out of our domain. Once we get through the domain, typically the next thing we wanna do is set our numerators and denominators equal to zero, because certain things will happen when the numerator is zero, when the denominator is zero, or potentially when they're both zero. They all play out with different traits here. But setting the numerator to zero will get you x-intercepts. We'll set x equal to zero and find the y-intercept. End behavior is going to take a lot to unpack. There's a lot of options with end behavior. You might have arrows like you did in the previous um, type of function with polynomials, but you're more likely to have a horizontal asymptote or potentially even a slant asymptote. Now, horizontal asymptotes are horizontal lines, and the equation of a horizontal line is y equals the number. And then sometimes we will actually have slant asymptotes, and that slant asymptote will have your, your standard, or I shouldn't say standard, your, your slope-intercept form of your line, y equaling mx plus b. And as I scoot this page up just a bit, you can actually see this, this rational function here does have a slant asymptote. It has some verticals and it has a slant. All right, we will pick up vertical asymptotes. Vertical asymptotes are vertical boundary lines that your function can't cross over. All right, so they're kind of like, we, not kind of, we, we dot them when we make them on the graphs and your function will never cross over them. And the, the thing that sometimes becomes a misnomer is while you can never cross a vertical asymptote, your graph will never cross a vertical asymptote, it's very possible that it graphs, or excuse me, it crosses a horizontal or a slant. But sometimes students think, oh, you can never cross an asymptote. You can't cross verticals, but you can cross horizontals and slants. And then last but not least, we're gonna talk about holes, all right? Or sometimes there's, these are referred to as removable discontinuities. All right, so we'll talk about where holes occur on your graph, how to represent them when you actually go to graph me that function. But like I said, rational functions, this section, there's a lot to unpack. I could not recommend more that you actually take a look at all of the examples here. If you have time, play those extra um, Khan Academy videos I put up on Canvas. This, this section is intense, all right? So with that, let's get going. We're gonna start where you should always start, with your domain, all right? So we're gonna find the domain of a rational function. Now, I've mentioned this a few times. There will always be three domain issues as we move through this entire course. And here comes one of them, right? The first domain issue is whenever you have a fraction where the denominator is zero, that is a problem. All right, we can't have that happening. The second issue is when you have an even indexed radical 
of a negative radicand, right? So even index with a negative radicand. Okay, and then the third one is when you take the logarithm of a zero or a negative number. Or another way of saying that is your argument is zero or negative. All right, we're gonna face this one head on in this section. What do you do when your fraction, when you have a fraction and the denominator is zero? We don't touch on this too much. We talked about it a little bit, not so much with graphing functions, but with evaluating radicals. And we will unpack this later in chapter six. So this is coming. All right, so a function that is defined by a quotient, right? A ratio of polynomials is a rational function. It has the form f of x equaling your polynomial on your numerator, p of x, and your polynomial on your denominator under the stipulation that your denominator cannot be zero. We're not allowed to divide by zero. So the domain of a rational function includes all real numbers except those that make the denominator q of x equal to zero. All right, so we're gonna start our domains with all real numbers and then we're gonna kick out, we're gonna give the boot to certain numbers where your denominator zeroes out. So as we move through this section, we're gonna, we're always gonna start with domain, but then after I figure out the domain, I'm always gonna determine where do my numerator and denominator equal zero. So that's always a game plan, figure out where everything zeroes out. That's why we spent so much time in section 5.5 trying to find zeros of polynomials because we really need to identify where the numerator and denominator zero out. They become traits when we go to graph our rational function. All right, so with that, let's take a look at our first example. So let me scooch this all the way up. There we go, all right. So this says for each rational function, find all numbers that are not in the domain, then give the domain using interval notation. So if we just take a quick look here, I can see I have four rational functions because I have four fractions, right? Numerator, denominator, numerator, denominator, numerator, denominator, numerator, denominator. All right, so let's see if we can start to unpack how to find the domain. If you wanna find the domain, what you really wanna focus on with fractions is where does the denominator zero out? All right, so let's see. If I wanted to set my denominator to zero, I would let x minus six be equal to zero. And this is a nice linear denominator, right? Linear factor, so I would just get x equaling six here. So the only number I'm not allowed to plug into this function is six, because six minus six would zero out the denominator. But you could plug one in, you could plug negative 22, you could pick 43 over four, it doesn't matter. Anything as long as it's not six. Now if I wanna write this up in an interval notation, Keep in mind, for polynomials, we always went all the way left to all the way right. Yeah, negative infinity to positive infinity. And we're starting with all real numbers, but I need to give the boot to the number six. So if you remember how we give the boot to one number at a time, is we will say, well, we'll start at negative infinity and go right up to six, but we'll exclude it. We'll put the parentheses. And then we'll start right after six and go to positive infinity. So that's how you can give the boot to one number at a time when you're talking about domain. You take that one interval that was initially negative infinity to infinity, and you split it up into two intervals with the six or whatever number you want to boot out of your domain, that being the, the cutoff for those new parentheses. All right, so let's take a look at part B, all right? I've got a fraction, so I've got a rational function. I've got to worry about when is my denominator equal to zero. So when is x squared minus x minus six equal to zero? Well, this happens to be a quadratic function or a quadratic equation, right? So I can go ahead and I can factor, I can complete the square, or I can use the quadratic formula. I see a way to factor this. I see two numbers that multiply to negative six and add up to negative one. I see x minus three and x plus two. And through the zero product property, if I let each of those zero out, I get three and negative two respectively. So for this function in part B, I can plug any number in with the exception of three and negative two, right? So if I wanted to write this up another way, f of three does not exist 
right? f of negative 2 does not exist. But every other x value I want to plug in is legit. All right, so how do I write up the domain? You have to think about going low to high as you move through the domain. So I'm always going to start at negative infinity. The first number you would encounter on the x-axis, if you were going low to high, you would actually run into negative 2 first. Because negative 2 on the number line is left of positive 3. So I'm going to run into negative 2. I'm going to give it the boot. I'm going to start back up again at negative 2, and I'm going to go to 3. And then I'm going to give it the boot, and I'm going to end at infinity. So let me put a little separation here so we can see it. All right, so there is the domain of that function. Okay, so moving along there, I have a fraction here, so I want to set my denominator to zero. Well, five doesn't equal zero. That's fine, that's great. So that means I keep my domain at negative infinity to positive infinity. It stays all real numbers. And maybe you're noticing this, this is just the equation of a line. All right, this function is 2 fifths x plus 3 fifths. It's the equation of a line, or oops, let me scoot that up. It's a polynomial, so its domain is actually all real numbers. But you could also have figured that out by just taking note that the denominator doesn't zero out. This happens to be a line. Okay, last but not least, we've got this rational function. So let's set x squared plus 1 equal to 0. I would move the 1 over, square root both sides, so I would get x being equal to the positive or negative square root of negative 1. But we talked about that back in chapter 2. That's plus or minus i. Well, this is not a real number. OK? And if it's not a real number, oops, I still need to scooch that up just a bit. Hold up. I'm getting there. My bad. All right, if that's not a real number, then I don't have to worry about giving it the boot from, from my domain. So my domain here still stays at negative infinity to infinity. I don't have to boot any real numbers. And I always think of this as, if I'm just looking at this expression of x squared plus 1, you can think of it as you're starting at positive 1, right? And you're only adding something positive to it. So there's no way that 1 will actually decrease back down to 0. You know what I'm saying? Like if this is 1 and I want to see when this expression goes to 0, if I start at 1 and I only get larger, it'll never come back down to 0. So I don't have to worry about when this denominator is 0. It never zeroes out. All right. So with that, we've taken our first look at domain. And I want to stress that this is always where you should start. Okay. And then once you figure out what you're booting from your domain, and you can see in, a, in example one, we only had two, um, two of these functions um, were given, or two, for two of these functions, we booted certain numbers from the domain. These two stayed all real numbers. But for these functions, x equals 6 will turn into one of two things. It'll turn into a vertical asymptote or a whole. And I'll, I'll show you how to decide which. Same thing with 3 and negative 2. It'll either turn into a vertical asymptote on our graph or a whole. And I'll teach you how to discern which of those two it, it turns into. All right, so with that, on the next page, we're officially going to pick up vertical asymptotes. Holes are coming. All right, I don't want you to think they won't be here, but they're not here just yet. All right, so with that, let's head on over to example two. Thanks, gang. Bye.